Good evening. I'd like to call to order tonight's zoning board meeting. Uh, as some of you in the audience know, this is a reconvene case. Uh, it is case number 2012-4. Uh, for those in the audience who weren't with us on October 17, uh, tonight, because it is a continuation of a public hearing, we will not be taking new testimony from the public tonight. That's what we did on October 17. The issue that brings us back here tonight and the reason that we weren't able to conclude our deliberations on the 17th was because we had a dispute in terms of what the authority of the zoning board was when we got to the point of deciding um, how we were interpreting the zoning ordinances and in particular which state statute we were following under and whether the zoning board had any authority uh, to attach any conditions uh, should it decide to reverse the town planner's decision. We have met with town council and we are of the opinion that we are proceeding pursuant to RSA 674 colon 33, which does authorize us to exercise uh, conditions. Um, Based upon that, we would ordinarily be opening up and going directly into deliberation since we had closed the hearing at the last session. Between the last session and tonight, however, we learned that two abutters did not receive proper notice. And rather than start the proceeding all over again, after speaking to the counsel for the applicant, uh, we decided that the best way to approach this was to uh, provide a transcript of the prior hearing to the abutters that did not receive notice and those abutters um, because they didn't have an opportunity to speak at the last hearing will be given an opportunity to speak and then the applicant and or counsel will have an opportunity should he wish to do so to respond to those particular arguments then we will go into deliberation so i don't want the fact that i'm taking testimony from one person to suggest that we are favoring that person. That is a person who by law should have received notice and did not. Um, I want uh, the record to reflect one other housekeeping matter. Today, various members of the zoning board received by email some additional uh, materials. Uh, we have received notices throughout this case from interested towns folks who want their records to be held in the public file. Uh, because of the timing of it, the town planner disseminated that information by email to the board members and uh, any of the parties in this matter or council, if you wish to take a look at the public file just to make sure you're up to date, please feel free to do so. Uh, we received correspondence, um, an email from Mr. Bennett uh, about some materials that were on the web page. We also received a letter from Deborah McGill and Dennis Harrington and one from Cindy Marsland. At this point, I am going to recognize um, whoever wishes to speak on behalf of the abutters who were not notified uh, correctly, and that would be uh, abutters Ross Bennett and or Judith Northrop Bennett. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate the opportunity to address the board. I don't know that I got the right number of copies, but. Um, I appreciate the board has already heard a lot of public input on this issue and has already deliberated it. So, one of the comments is that aspects of the discussion were not fully explored at the last meeting. Um, as a brief introduction, I grew up on my grandfather's farm here in Hanover. I've worked at several farms to help him my way through college. For the last two years, I've supplemented my backyard garden with a community supported agriculture share from a group of local farmers. Um, I, I support the agritourism law because New Hampshire needs more farms and needs to help the farms that can stay in business. My concern is that the potential scale of the applicant's attempt to the use of the agritourism definition to bypass local zoning regulations. The applicant would have you believe that almost any commercial activity occurring on a working farm is exempt from zoning regulations. The agritourism definition clearly states that any zoning exemptions must be ancillary to the agricultural use of the property. If it is an ancillary, it is an agritourism. The last part of the agritourism definition reads, for the purpose of eating a meal, list a number of activities that I think you guys are all familiar with at this point. 
or active involvement in the activity of the farm, which is ancillary to the farm operation. During the last round of deliberations, the board decided to interpret the ancillary clause as only applying to the last item on the list. But if you read the last item, active involvement in the activity of the farm, which is ancillary to the farm operation independently, the ancillary clause becomes obsolete because any activity of the farm is by definition ancillary to the farm operation. And I don't believe the, lawmaker, the lawmakers inserted the ancillary to the farm operation simply to take up space. They included it because it should apply to all items on the list. Alternatively, if you don't accept this interpretation of the ancillary clause, weddings are not specifically listed in the first part of the definition. So they must fall under the active involvement in the activity of the farm, which must be ancillary to the farm operation. The ancillary clause signals that the scale of exempted commercial use must be subordinate to the scale of agricultural use. The applicant himself believed this interpretation of the definition since he or his counsel made several unsupported attempts at convincing you that the proposed weddings are ancillary to Christmas tree farm activities. The applicant's proposed use for weddings and events is much larger than the current agriculture use of the property by any measure. In terms of employee hours worked, revenue, impacted area, or number of visitors. This should be established based on facts, not just because someone says it's ancillary. In fact, the Athlone's current use of the, commercial use of the property to sell trailers for important Christmas trees and ornaments is likely already close to, if not more than ancillary to the agricultural use of the property. So it may not have much more ancillary left to use. If the board misinterprets the ancillary clause of the agritourism definition, it sets a precedent for future zoning exemptions. Since forestry and lumber are also under the definition of agriculture, can every woodlot, large woodlot owner in town entertain establishing a commercial racetrack or ATV course with no local input? Can every woodlot in town entertain building a hardware store so long as they sell a couple of boards a year that are grown on the property? This is not the intent of the agritourism law. The lawmakers clearly included the ancillary clause in order to keep the agritourism law from allowing large commercial undertakings from getting a free pass to bypass zoning. Accepting the Appoint's radical interpretation of the agritourism definition sets a dangerous precedent for the town. It sends the message that any commercial activity can be established or expanded so long as it maintains a thin veneer of agriculture. I have retained an attorney, Michael Donovan, and I would like him to take a couple of minutes to explain the legal doctrines and apply to this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I'm attorney Michael Love, and I'm representing Oz, as he, as he just said. And I would like to review with you some of the legal doctrines behind the three grounds that the applicant has brought in this appeal. A grandfathering, assessor of use, and the advertorism ad argument. But before I do that, I'd like to distribute a, a memorandum <coughs> uh, to each of you that I've prepared. I'm going to go through that in a fair amount of detail. Um, I'll do that first. Thank you. Lessons are in fact in the library. Design. Legal counsel. These are for each of you. Five. Exactly what was in the record or not. So I'm going to give you four other documents that I think are important just because I want to be sure they're in the record. And they may even be in the record. I'm not giving each of you copies of them. Um, I'm only going to briefly refer to them. One is an AFA, uh, I'm sorry, an AFF American Forest Foundation inspection report from 2007, which reports that there's um, 
3,000 trees on the tree farm. That's an issue. I think you have that in the record. But if not, you do not. Um, the second one is on the minutes of the legislative committees that discuss the definition of agritourism when uh, that definition was enacted in the statutes in 2007. I think that's in your record, but it wasn't clear to me. So now you have the minutes of both the Senate committees and the House committees that discussed um, that definition. Third, I think Mr. Uh, Spencer Bennett has put this in the record, but again, I'm not sure. It's an excerpt from one of the several websites that talk about the wedding venue at the tree farm that we're talking about tonight. <coughs> And the last is a news release from 2009. This is not in the record. This is new information. Um, it's a report of the 2007 Census of Agriculture uh, for the five states of New England. And uh, from this report, you will note that there, are pro there were, in 2007, approximately 27,000 farms in the four states of Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and Massachusetts. Now, if you have a memo in front of you, uh, you can probably follow pretty much what I'm going to say from that, from that memo. Let's begin with grandfathering. There are three key words here when one deals with a grandfathering issue, and that's called burden of proof. Those three words are very important, burden of proof. It's clearly established in New Hampshire law that the party that is asserting the right to a grandfathered use has the burden of producing the evidence to establish that that use was there on the date that the zoning ordinance was enacted, which here in Hacker was in 1987. What our Supreme Court has said about grandfathering are several things, but among them are the use must have been in existence at the time of enactment of the zoning ordinance. Not necessarily four or five years before the enactment of the zoning ordinance, but when the zoning ordinance was enacted, which is not going to be set up. The court has also said a non-conforming use may be lost by abandonment if it's not continued by an unbroken sequence after the enactment of the ordinance. <coughs> and the court also feels very strongly about the general policy of zoning to carefully limit the enlargement of non-conforming uses. Now, what this means is that the applicant who is trying to establish grant policy must show the evidence that that use was there at the time of the zoning ordinance, and also continually since then, which has been uh, since I've been approximately 25 years ago. Uh, now, the applicant here has not met his burden of proof of establishing that what he wants to do now was going on in 1987. In this regard, the wedding venue events that he is advertising on the website talk about tents, tables and chairs for up to 150 wedding guests, porta potties, <coughs> full service dinners, music, dancing, bar service, golf carts to take people from these 150 guests from a parking area off the field somewhere up to the main venue. That is what the use is here. There is no evidence before you that that use was going on in 1987. It's disingenuous for this applicant to suggest that submitting to you his justice of the peace licenses in the 80s and a marriage certificate for 1984 meet his burden of proof of grandfather. Contrary to his assertion in one of the written documents filed with you, those licenses do not expressly grant authority to marry people. We all know JPs can marry people. The license itself doesn't say anything about that, and it certainly doesn't say anything about marrying people at this location on Hunger Road. And if you look at that wedding certificate, it doesn't even say where the wedding was at. It could have been somewhere else. It could have been uh, anywhere else. Really. It obviously was performed by the applicant. <coughs> Thus, the applicant has not met his burden of proof on draft filing. Now, moving on to accessory uses. Again, three key words. Burden of proof. The Henneker Zoning Ordinance defines accessory uses as virtually every zoning ordinance does is a building or use subordinate and customary incidental to the main building or use on the same lot. And again, the applicant has the burden of proof of proving both of these facts, that the use that he wants is subordinate to the tree farm, 
and also that is customarily incidental to the prefire use. Let's consider first subordinate use. The applicant has not established that the use will be subordinate. As I just indicated, the 2005 certification of the tree farm indicates he's got 3,000 Christmas trees growing there. The evidence in your record indicates the tree farm is only open a few weeks a year before Christmas. Most of the trees sold, we are told, are shipped in from somewhere else. I saw the number 200 somewhere in the, in the record. Compare that modest tree farm use with the, with the prospective wedding venue use. Weddings, 26 months, 24 weeks of the year. Now, it's not uncommon in a wedding venue to have a, a weekend, two weddings in the same day. I've had my son get married uh, at a wedding venue in, in Manchester about 10 years ago, and they had to clear out by a certain time because there was another wedding coming right in afterwards. It's not uncommon to have more than one wedding at a venue um, each, uh, each weekend day. This is a use which will swallow up the tree farm use. It will not be supportive to it. It will become the principal use. For example, the sale of, say, 30 Christmas trees at $30 per would generate only $9,000 of income. Two weddings would typically gen on a weekend would typically generate more than that $9,000. I can speak from personal experience of helping my son with his wedding at Pat's Peak this summer that weddings are expensive. A wedding venue can cost at least $5,000. If there's one a week for the 24 weeks offered by the applicant, that revenue generated is $120,000, far in excess of tree farm revenue. By way of another example, let's, let's talk about traffic. With weddings of 150 guests, two persons arriving in the car, and two weddings a weekend over that six month period, you're talking about 7,200 <coughs> vehicle trips using that very substandard Hunger Road to get to this site. Whereas three or 400 people traveling up to divide Christmas trees are roughly twice the number of trips, 600, 800. So we're talking about almost 10, 12 times the amount of traffic to be generated potentially by a wedding venue than we are by that tree farm. In order to determine that the tree farm is the principal use and the wedding function will be subordinate, this board needs financial statements and tax returns for the tree farm enterprise and more information about the business plan for the wedding venue events so that you can make an evaluation, is this really the subordinate use? The applicant hasn't given you that information. Uh, Spencer Bennett told me back on October 17th about needing that kind of information. You need that. You don't have the evidence to conclude that this wedding venue is going to be supported and not principal use. And that is not your fault. That the responsibility lies with the applicant to meet his burden of proof. He's also not met his burden of proof on the customary, customarily incidental nature of the use. He's given you a list of 16 farms with wedding venues. Only one is exclusively tree farm. If you look, only half of those have uh, detailed information. He's giving you a list of 16, and he's giving you information from about eight websites. The Rocks up in Bethlehem, uh, several of you probably been there, I have, but that's, that's exclusively tree farm. That's the only one that's exclusively tree farm. These 16 examples come from four states, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and Vermont. And as I indicated earlier, there are, and I just put the evidence in the record on that, there are 27,000 farms in those four states. 16 out of 27,000 doesn't meet the task which the applicant's attorney has said, Justice Souter said, that accessory uses must be associated with a principal use with a frequency that is substantial enough to rise above a rarity. 16 out of 27,000 is simply not enough. And, and that's actually of, of farms. There's only one tree farm, that is, uh, exclusive tree farm, I believe, that they've given evidence of, and that's the rocks. Now let's move on and talk about agritourism. What becomes important here is what lawyers and courts call the rules of statutory construction. First, there's an important misunderstanding here on the applicant's part, and I think perhaps on the board's part so far, about the structure of RSA 2134A. And I've attached to my memorandum a 
copy of this of the statute, which um, printed out from one of the many places you can go to on the web and print out statutes. And if you look, I, I'd really like the board to take a minute and look carefully at this as I go through it. It's titled Farm Agricultural Farming. Subparagraph one defines farm. Subparagraph two defines agriculture and farming. And there are eight <coughs> activities. I'm sorry, there are, are uh, 12 enumerated activities that make up uh, the definition of agriculture and farming. But then if you look at the last page in subparagraphs four and five, what those do is those set forth separate def definitions. Farmer's market is defined and agritourism is defined. But, very importantly, agritourism doesn't appear on the lists in either subparagraph one, which defines farm, or subparagraph two, which defines agriculture and farming. So the assertion that agritourism is part of the definition of the farm is simply not correct. What this statute does is this defines several things, but uh, including agritourism. Now, accepting for a minute that while agritourism is not included in the definition, definition of farm or farming, let's, let's assume that it <coughs> is part of the definition and talk about statutory construction. Because when the courts, uh, courts in New Hampshire are the ultimate arbiters of the meaning of statutes and also the meaning of zoning ordinances. And where possible, they'll try and interpret the plain meaning of the word, where it's used, and then they'll go to the rules of construction. And the first applicable rule is, is used in generis, where specific words in the statute follow general ones. The general ones are construed to embrace only objects similar in nature to those enumerated. Here, the general term agritourism is followed by specifics. Eat a meal, overnight stays, enjoyment of farm environment, educational farm operations, active involvement in the farm, and so on. Weddings are not similar in nature to these type of activities. In this regard, an important point that I think the board needs to recognize is the attractiveness of this applicant's property for wedding venues is not a tree farm. I mean, let's, let's be reasonable uh, and, and use our common sense. People, brides and grooms, are not going there to observe the Christmas trees and interact with the Christmas trees. They're going there for the tremendous view to the east that exists from that site. Some of you, I think, have been up there, and there's really a marvelous view off to the east. That's what's attractive about this site as a wedding venue. It isn't the pine trees. They're not in action. They're not going to interact with those uh, Christmas trees. Secondly, let's talk about the last antecedent rule. And I think Ross um, Bennett has, has covered it well. And, but what the board needs to be aware of is what applies here is the exception to the rule which our Supreme Court has carved out. When, a, when this statute is read as a whole, the intent of the phrase ancillary to the farm operation in subparagraph 6 <coughs> applies to all of the listed activities, eating meals, staying stay overnight, and the like, not just to the last, uh, the last phrase. And if you review those, and they're fairly long, the discussion of the Senate Committee on Energy, Environment, and Economic Development, when it was discussing agritourism and the definition, I think it becomes apparent that they view um, uh, whatever the agritourism activities may be, they have to be in, in to, the, to the farm. And I want to wind up by talking a bit about legislative intent. A court will review legislative intent only if the statute is ambiguous. And it's important to understand that a review of legislative intent involves the only the record of the legislature's consideration of, of the legislation which resulted in the statute. Statements made, made by legislators during floor debates and committee meetings, testimony before the committees, minutes of the committee meetings, those are the relevant records from which the court will determine legislative intent. Statements made by others after the enactment, such as the letter you have from the Commissioner of Agriculture, whose job is to promote and advocate farming interests. 
That has nothing to do with legislative intent. It, it, the court would not even view that as relevant. It would look only at what was said to these committees when this legislation was being crafted and, uh, and enacted. And in that vein, the statement of Gail Gilley, the state's director of agriculture and development, before the Senate Education and Environment Committee, is very important. I quoted that on the last page of my memo. The, and I'm going to just quote it again here. The ability of the farm operator to offer activities such as corn mazes, corn to hay rides, farm days, meals, barn tours, bedding farms, harvest your own apples or Christmas trees, and so on. So this goes on. It's important for many not only to draw people to the farms so they can ultimately purchase products but also their income generated. That is what agritourism is. That is what the, legislat the legislative committees were told it was when they were considering this, uh, uh, this definition. And it does not include things like wedding venues and special events and receptions. So in conclusion, uh, we are, uh, Ross and I are asking you to deny the appeal that is in front of you and affirm the administrative decision that the town planner has made and I certainly would be glad to answer any questions if members of the board have. Thank you for uh, your attention. I apologize for being so long, but it's an important issue for my clients, and it really is an issue that needs to be addressed in depth. Thank you very much. Before we proceed to Attorney Miller, does anybody on the board have any questions for Attorney Donovan? <coughs> Miller, would you like to uh, respond? Very briefly, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to refocus the board, if I may, on a couple of key points. Um, and I'll try and uh, take them in order. The first question has to do with the, uh, the definition of agritourism and what agritourism means. And there was reference made to this letter, which is in the record, from Lorraine Merrill, the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture markets and food, who interprets uh, the definition of agritourism in <coughs> 2134A in that letter that's in your record. Um, and her conclusion is that the term agritourism, and she defines what the statute says, and she says, we, meaning her department, interprets on-farm weddings to fall within the statutory definition. While that may not be dispositive in terms of uh, you know, what the ultimate authority is. I agree, the ultimate authority uh, is the Supreme Court. But right now, sitting here today, this is the best authority we have on what the commissioner of the department, whose job it is to interpret that statute, at least until the courts get involved, thinks. And she thinks that on-farm weddings fall within the definition of agritourism, which is consistent with what the USDA thinks. Um, so this is not a radical definition. It's not a radical interpretation of the definition. Um, it's very consistent. Um, Attorney Donovan mentioned a little bit about legislative intent, and he gave you the legislative history that I also reviewed. I think it's important for you to understand, however, that that legislative history and the legislative change came about because of the Farm Viability Task Force that was put into place to propose changes to the legislation to help farmers, but also balance community interests in managing the farms in their communities. That task force report, as a reminder, is behind Exhibit Tab 16 in the book I submitted last month to you. The commissioner, who says that on-farm weddings are part of agritourism, was on that task force. And that task force proposed the legislation that Attorney Donovan was talking about. So to say that it has nothing to do with legislative intent is, is not quite right when you look at the actual way that the legislation came about. Second thing Attorney Donovan does uh, in his memo is he tries to say that weddings are not accessory to a tree farm and then says that I only gave you one example of a tree farm in New Hampshire that has weddings. That's not the correct way to interpret it. A tree farm is one of the exemplars, if you look at the, even at the back of his own memo, section 2134A is the definition, Roman 2 is the definition of agriculture. And it says the words agriculture and farming mean all operations of a farm including 
And then in uh, subset 11, Christmas trees grown as part of a commercial Christmas, Christmas tree operation, meaning that that is one of many different examples of agriculture. That section, uh, even taking Attorney Donovan's uh, interpretive uh, rule, it says in Roman 2, the words agriculture mean all operations of a farm, including, and tree farm or Christmas tree farm is one of the definitions of agriculture. But when you're looking to determine either an accessory use or uh, agritourism, agriculture is bigger than just tree farms. Agriculture is all agriculture. And you don't parse out one of those pieces and then look just at that. You look at what farms do, because Christmas tree farms are a subset of larger farms, larger ag uh, agricultural uses. Um, another point Attorney Donovan made was that uh, we only provided 16 examples out of 27,000 farms. I did not in any way try and bury the board with every example of every farm in New England or elsewhere that has on-site weddings. I gave you 16 examples. There are many, many more. Um, I think that point is probably understood, but I'll make it for the record that uh, we're not limited to 16 farms in New Hampshire that have on-site weddings. There are many more. I just gave you 16. As for um, which uses are uh, subordinate, the memo tries to make this an issue of economics, but there aren't any cases that say that it's about economics. It's about use. Accessory use or ancillary use to the farm as a farm first. So when you say, why do people, last month we had uh, Diamond Hill Farm here. Diamond Hill Farm puts its tent in the back. There's not a particular view other than of the farm. But people like to go have weddings on farms, and I have submitted to you uh, evidence in the record that states that. It's not necessarily about view, it's about people wanting to be in a rural agricultural environment to get married. And that's why people go to farms to get married. It's not everybody's taste, uh, but it is some people's taste. And Steve will tell you that people go to the Christmas tree farm because they like the smell of the Christmas trees, they like looking at the Christmas trees, and that's part of their uh, decision making to go get married. <coughs> A um, couple of other quick points, uh, you know, the slippery slope argument. Nobody's making any arguments that we're going to have two weddings a weekend for 24 weeks. Uh, I don't think that came up anywhere in the record. Uh, Mr. Forrester wants the ability to use his farm in an ancillary way to host weddings. How many? We're not sure, but it's certainly not going to be two a weekend for 24 weeks. Uh, there's not going to be a wedding facility put on there. Uh, we're not going to be building a, a hall to, to host weddings on the property. Uh, you know, the use is pretty obvious. You put up a tent, you have a, a, a meal there, you have a section of the farm where they get married, and then people move on. And not everybody wants to have a wedding in that environment. <coughs> Most people want to be married inside uh, in a typical facility. It takes a very special couple to want to get married in that environment. And to, to suggest that there are going to be two a weekend for 24 weeks a year is just not uh, within the realm of reason. Okay, so um, I just want to make sure that everyone on the board is aware that before the meeting started, I dropped a, uh, an additional piece of uh, information in front of you. And I just want to point you to a couple of uh, statutory sections to help guide your decision making tonight. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of them if everybody has uh, this document in front of you. RSA 70, uh, 672 colon 1, Declaration of Purpose, talks about agricultural activities. And that section in Roman 3b says, agricultural activities shall not be unreasonably limited by use of municipal planning and zoning powers or by the unreasonable interpretation of such powers. Now, why are we talking about agricultural activities? Just a reminder to what we did last month. Agritourism is an agricultural activity. 
That's by definition in the statute of 2134A. <coughs> Farm weddings are agritourism. How do, we, how do we argue that? That's from Commissioner Merrill's letter. It's from guidance from the New Hampshire Farm Viability Task Force report, which was in Exhibit 16 of the materials we submitted last month, and the USDA's National Agritourism Initiative, which talks about farm weddings as part of agritourism. Second, um, if you go to uh, Roman 3D, the question is, what is unreasonable interpretation? That's, that's a hard line to draw. So the statute helps. And it says, for purposes of paragraph 3B, unreasonable interpretation includes the failure of local land use authorities to recognize that agriculture, when practiced in accordance with applicable laws and regulations, is a traditional, fundamental, and accessory use of land throughout New Hampshire, and that a prohibition on these uses cannot be inferred from the failure of an ordinance or regulation to address them. Now, why is that important tonight? Because the Henniker Ordinance doesn't talk about weddings, and it doesn't define agritourism. But you cannot look at that and say, well, because it's not there, they must not have wanted to do it. Because this statute tells you you shouldn't do that. And the reason for that is because the legislature has decided that in close calls, agriculture is supposed to be interpreted broadly to help the farmers. That was the whole point of the task force and the change to the statute that was made as a result of it. Finally, if you look at 674.32a, there's a presumption. And this helps also uh, in these close call situations. And what that says is, in accordance with RSA 672.1.3d, whenever agricultural activities are not explicitly addressed with respect to any zoning district or location, they shall be deemed to be permitted there as either a primary or accessory use, as long as conducted in accordance with best management practices adopted by the Commissioner of Agriculture, Markets, and Food. That's the commissioner whose letter I gave you. And with federal and state laws, regulations, and rules. It doesn't say may be deemed to be permitted there. It says shall be permitted there. So that's important in these gap filling situations where you're not sure what to do because your ordinance doesn't quite cover it. The New Hampshire legislature has said the tie goes to the farm. Unless there are any questions, I'll conclude. Does any board member have a question of Attorney Miller at this point? Yeah, I have one. Uh, you, you underlined in what you gave us uh, a sentence that says that uh, we should, the activity shall not be unre unreasonably limited by the use of municipal land and zoning powers. There was an underlying theme during our previous meeting in your testimony that because this was a permitted use under all the different things that you proposed, that we couldn't have anything to say about, and it was, the planning board couldn't place any restrictions on the size of the parties that could be held there, or the events, or anything. Uh, this says shall not be unreasonably limited. Are you still making the position that none of the town boards can have anything to say about how large these can get to be, and that they that just because it's agritourism that you can do anything you want? No, and, and that's a good question. And um, I think the statutory section you're quoting from is a little different from the, from the one we talked about last month. So uh, let's take them apart, okay? The first one, it does say unreasonably limited, which does suggest that there are some limitations that can be put on. And some of the things that I talked about last month that I think are reasonable uh, to be discussed are traffic, for example, and uh, noise. Uh, as you know, and uh, the uh, person from Diamond Hill, uh, Jane Presby, who was here last month, talked about how 
she worked out with her neighbors a reasonable uh, uh, parking situation where she parks all her cars off of the road so they don't park on the road. We've done the same thing. And also controlled hours of music and volume of music so as not to become a nuisance to the neighbors. I think those are all things that both the statute, uh, the, the New Hampshire statute, and the local um, analog to it would allow uh, to happen, and things that we've already proposed that we're willing to do. But beyond that, in terms of how many or uh, things like that, I think it become dicey. Give me an example of where you think it's appropriate to establish a law. I think we were talking about <coughs> numbers of people, numbers of cars, numbers of events. Uh, you know, the dilemma I see is <coughs> defining what's reasonable and what's unreasonable. Sure. Uh, the zoning board has some inherent powers, and among its inherent powers are the health, safety, and welfare of the community. So if this use was making that road uh, unsafe because people were parking on both sides of it and making the road impassable, for example, which is not going to happen, and we've already said that it's not going to happen because we're going to be able to park all of our cars either on uh, a lot that's internal to Mr. Forster's farm or, if necessary, we'll be willing to <coughs> shuttle people from a different place to, uh, to the location. Um, but if there were, say, a situation where the road was unsafe to pass because there were people parking on both sides of it, um, as sometimes happens during hunting season, for example, uh, then that would be something I think that the zoning board would take uh, issue with and, and be right to do so. Um, I'm not sure that your inherent powers would extend to picking an arbitrary number and saying you can have six weddings but not eight. So when you were referring back to the first thing you said that it, you wouldn't have 20 or whatever it was, two a day, or however yeah, it was, was 24 months. To, to the comment made in the prior presentation that there are 24 weekends during the non-snow season and you could have two a day and it would produce so many cars or whatever. <coughs> that's, that's not anywhere within the realm of what's being proposed here. That's the, that's the slippery slope. like. What if this happened? And that's that's just not what anybody is intending for this property. Okay. And it's not going to become a function hall, right? No, no. I was. You said you, you said that you wouldn't limit the number, but then you also said it wouldn't be the other number. So I was yeah, just it, getting it, a clarification on if, that. Yeah. No, I'm good. I understand okay. what you said. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. We're going to close the public hearing at this point and resume board deliberations. And I believe as a procedural matter where we are is that we do have a motion by Bob Stamps that was pending when we tabled and we can decide whether we want to have further discussion on that, whether there are going to be amendments, whether it's going to be withdrawn, whether we're going to vote on it. The motion. Uh, you want me to state it? Sure. Uh, I move to overturn the decision carried out by the town planner with the condition that, that the applicant goes to the planning board for site plan review to discuss, an, to discuss an acceptable plan for the applicant and the inquiries. That was my motion. Can I hear from the board as to what type of action they wish to take on the motion that is pending? Can I just clarify the motion to make sure I have it right? Please. Sure. To overturn the decision that was previously made by the town planner with the condition that it goes to site to the planning board for site plan review. And I couldn't hear the rest. Yes, I was reading it directly from the minutes. So yeah. okay. so exactly what you phrase, I just want Sorry, to I'm sure that in there exactly. Thank you.
given a number of issues here, we might want to have a more thorough motion dealing with <coughs> points that were raised in the case. One way we could approach this, if Bob sort of came, came to the end and, and made a motion, one way we, we could approach this was to, it would be to address each of the issues, whether it is a permitted use by virtue of being grandfathered, whether it is a permitted use by virtue of being an accessory use, and we could go through the various steps and vote on each one. Yeah, and thanks, Commissioner. I, I forgot that I also amended the motion. I amended the motion to include that the ongoing activity falls under agritourism and meets the definition of agriculture. And I I'm sorry. Uh, I amended the motion to include that the ongoing activity does fall under agritourism and meets the definition of agriculture as stated in RSA 2134A. That was what I had done last meeting. Uh, I thought we also stated that it wasn't grandfathered. I can get thoroughly discussed in the meeting and about grandfathering. There was, there was no motion on it. There was no motion on it. There was discussion on it only. And, and I don't think that we should combine those issues. I think we ought to take them separately. Okay. I mean, the discussion about grandfathering comes on page 10 of the draft minutes from October 17th, uh, paragraph three, where Mr. Parker started the uh, discussion, so just for reference purposes. I would, I would prefer some type of action that got rid of that and we do a more proper Okay, I, I will withdraw the motion. I said, I withdraw the second. <laughs> That puts us in the dilemma of having to draft something new, of course. <laughs> Entertain a motion with respect to whether this is a permitted use by virtue of being a grandfathered use. I was just going to say. I don't, I don't believe it meets the test of grandfathering at all because it, uh, very basically it was because of the testimony in the last meeting that what's being contemplated there is a very significant increase in the level of activity. To dispatch with that particular aspect of the case, um, does a motion need to be made and seconded and, and then voted on? I think for purposes yeah. of okay. this case, we ought to address each of the issues separately and have a vote and explain sure. our, our reasons. That way everybody will know and there'll be a clean record for whoever wants to take this mm -hmm. to the next proceeding. Uh, can you read back what the chair would entertain as a motion for this, please? Jennifer? That this be a permitted use by virtue of being a grandfather. So moved. So is the, what, did you no, say not, what the motion is? No, not. We don't have to say the motion. Yeah, I didn't make a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 thought, I, I thought that was a good starting place. Okay. Let's talk about grandfathering. Let's come up with a motion. Someone can cite their reasons for moving one way or another on that topic. Well, I would make a simple motion that it doesn't meet the test of being permitted as a grandfather because of the substantial expansion of land and it's well I'll leave most of that I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and it's been seconded. That it doesn't meet the I test. Make a phone with my valuation so sorry. <laughs> Last time you did it gives you that. But it doesn't meet the test of it does not meet the test of a of a grandfather. It's not. It is not a grandfather use. A grand, it does not meet the test of being a grandfather use because of the significant expansion of the activities compared to what has been going on before. Which, what do you 
second that. Can I just... already second that. Are you already? That's yeah. Second. Discussion? Um, just as a note, you might want to add into that motion um, part of somewhere along the lines here of that it, um, that um, these, these, I'm not sure if these follow through, but the uh, use in existence at the time and that it needed to continue. I don't know if that helps clarify that a little bit. So in other words, you're questioning whether we have evidence in the record as to the scope and continuity of right, I, I think the use. If, right, if you just say that the general expansion, you might want to, because there was no, um, the evidence that was shown about the grandfather and was the one marriage license and the justice of the peace, and that that didn't really show that it had been going on continuously since before. So I, I think the record, Correct, the presentation and then the, the response from the Attorney Donald, I mean, from the discussion that we've had, to anybody that's interested in that, I think it's in the record. I agree. I, I think the motion should be very simple, but it does not, does not meet the grandfather test, period. Sure. And, then, and then from that point on in the deliberation, uh, as, as far as the discussion goes, the record then becomes clear on what the board's position has been. I agree that it doesn't need to be in the motion. I think that the board's um, reasons for voting one way or another with respect to the motion do need to be in the record. Correct. So do the motion to be amended to just say does not meet the test of the of grandfather, would you accept that as an amendment to the motion? I, I don't, I think what you know, it's at this point, I don't think, I think it does I can't hear you. Okay. I think that this motion is correct, that it explains in simple terms why. I think it's important. Further discussion on the motion, or are you ready to vote? Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> Bob, how do you vote? Do you agree? Does not, does not meet. Same. 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 Does not meet. Okay. Gigi, you don't get to vote? No, I'm sorry. Okay. We are Good unanimous time. then with respect to. Um, the issue on grandfathering. So we will move on <coughs> to one of the next issues, uh, which I believe would be accessory use, um, which is defined as an incidental, customary, and subordinate use to the agricultural use. For that one, open for discussion. And you're viewing ancillary as being close enough and in too subordinate. Yeah. 
Any further discussion about accessory use? Does anybody want to talk about whether there was evidence of it being uh, customarily incidental to the use? It seems to be. Other farms have done that. It seems to be a practice that is in use to some degree. An issue has been raised as whether customarily incidental as defined as an accessory use under the Henniker zoning ordinance <coughs> pertains only to Henniker as opposed to other communities. <coughs> well, in, in, I think I we have to question. Well, we have yeah. to look at the time frame then because this is a, a you know, um, and, and it probably goes well, 2134A uh, Roman 6. So, you know, as, an, as a use and as an ancillary use, um, as a customary, may become more customary now. Well, <laughs> that may be, but that's not the issue we have to decide. Henniker has already defined what an accessory use is in section 133.3. And we are being tasked to, to decide whether the evidence fulfills the definition that's been given to us by the town. It's at page two of the zoning ordinance. And we can decide it just based on whether you believe the event use is subordinate to the agricultural use. I just thought for purposes of completeness, we might want to address the rest of the text, which is whether it's also customarily incidental to the main use. Okay. Does anybody want to make a motion with respect to it? Further discussion on the motion in terms of whether the evidence has established this is a, that the events are subordinate 
and customarily incidental to the tree farm business. Again, I go back to the testimony that we gave at the last meeting where there was a description of the substantial growth of this part of the event business as compared to the ongoing tree farm business. And I, I don't have any problem with the, the council's suggestion that we aren't supposed to look at the economics, but I think that the economics involved here demonstrate the, the volume of the activity talking about instead of 3,000 trees growing on the hillside for most of the year and some sale of Christmas gadgets and lights for three or four weeks, all of a sudden you're talking about numbers like 150 people. It could be every weekend coming to a big event with a bunch of everything. But just to it doesn't qualify in my mind as being a silly or silly I think I agree with you. I think another issue is simply the calendar issue. Christmas trees are bought within a limited period of time, whereas weddings can be year round. <coughs> yeah. Further discussion with respect to accessory use? I I think that the, that the Christmas tree business does, although the sales are only happening at one time of the year, the growing is more all year round. But that said, I don't make the connection, and I've read through all the file, I don't make the connection from how the events are an accessory to the tree farm part of the business. Or whatever that was. So I agree with Leon. Further discussion on the motion? Are you ready to vote? Jen? That it's not an accessory use, nor is it a customary because of the reasons that were given, it is not considered an incidental use to the tree farm. I think I got also according to Henniker's own According to Henniker's own policy. Bruce, how do you vote? Agreed. Agreed that it is not an accessory use. Yes. I also agree. Agreed. We now have two issues that are somewhat related, but again, I think it's best that we separate them to keep the record as clear as we possibly can. Uh, one is whether uh, our ordinance is preempted by a comprehensive scheme regulating and authorizing this activity. And then the second as to whether this use is a permitted use uh, under the definition of agriculture within our zoning ordinance. I'm going to go out on a limb and suspect that the preemption argument might be the easier one to deal with first. And I'd entertain either a motion or just some general discussion about the concept of preemption. Well, as I understood the argument being that, that, the, that the town couldn't regulate this because there was a comprehensive uh, state uh, regulation uh, that would prohibit local regulation. I think that's somewhat difficult since our zoning ordinance specifically ties into RSA 2134 that talks about agriculture and agritourism. Well, in addition to that, the, the RSA that we mentioned so many times in the last hearing specifically says that the 
of activity can be subjected to local land use regulations. So I see no problem with our taking a position of whether or not they can do it. Yeah, I don't see a statute. I don't see statutory preemption here. I don't see where the state would, would preempt local land use provisions. Does anybody feel we need to take a motion on this? Would you summarize this for me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really new at this. <laughs> now we're we're voting on. Well, whether the state law uh, preempts our local jurisdiction. We are addressing what, as I understand, to be one of the four arguments that was initially raised in the application. That being preemption that we didn't get to make the decision. I don't think there's evidence that was presented that would indicate that we do not have the, um, the right to Regulate it. Okay. That's the consensus of the board, then I don't believe we need a motion on that. Right. Which is, brings us then to the, the last issue, which I suspect will be the most difficult for us to decide, um, and that concerns whether this is a permitted use under the definition of agriculture, the, the property is located in the rural residential zone. One of the permitted uses is agriculture. Again, our zoning ordinance defines that term by reference to the RSA. Now, interestingly, one of the arguments that's been raised that's somewhat new tonight is that there is a distinction in that statute between the definition of agriculture and farming and agritourism. That's an argument that was presented by Attorney Donovan that we didn't hear last time. I don't know what anybody on the board feels about that argument. interpretation of it, which is, this is me putting it into my own words, is that it's an event that takes place to draw people in to buy the primary product of the farm. And I don't see this as that happening there, so I don't think it's an all of use. Do you think about the argument that agritourism agri is different than agriculture since they're defined in different sections of this particular statute? Well, I think, I think our zoning ordinance specifically talks about the definition including 2134A as far as agricultural means inclusive. It includes everything through this entire uh, statute which would include uh, Roman six, which is the definition of agritourism. And I think that the, the use currently, that's, uh, as far as the wedding use, it does fall within the guidelines of the enjoyment of the farm environment. 
Roman numeral six ends up defining all that stuff. Uh, if you read the tail end of it, we're active in Roman activity of the time, which is not the tail end of the of Roman numeral six. Involvement in the activity of the farm, which is ancillary to the farm operation. So we're back to is it a minor part of the activity that goes on there? It's something this was discussed at the last one. After that comment, the next part of that says four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not in the part of the essential component. Yeah. I just wanted him to finish. Yeah. Um, I, I believe this was uh, eviscerated at the last meeting, um, and, and Chairwoman Connor brought this up about or, and she specifically asked me, I think you and I were the ones that were discussing that, and I said that these are two separate and distinct entities that the second half does not need to be included in the first half, and they could be looked at separately. I think that's what we discussed at the last meeting, and that's what prompted the the, uh, the motion by Mr. Stamps to overturn and, um, in, in, with the definition of agritourism as being a permitted uh, use under the term agriculture. So I, I, I think that Roman sick applies here and that the enjoyment of the farm environment is indeed part of our zoning ordinance as far as the definition of agriculture, which is 133.3, agriculture. See New Hampshire Revised Statute Annotated Chapters 2134A, farm, agriculture, farming. And that includes all those provisions. Somebody had a tree farm, not growing Christmas trees, but they had a hundred acre woodlot and they were growing oak, which they would harvest and make a huge amount of money. Would they also be agriculture and could they also include event because people would want to come see, be at the tree farm? Sure. If, they, if we read out the clause that talks about which is ancillary to the farm operation, and if we don't require a causal link between the activity and the farm, yes. See, that's, that's where I don't make the connection, where one goes with the other. I don't know where, how you would any, you know, 11 acre woodlot, how you could make that not be a commercial piece of property if you could have any activity there under agriculture for the enjoyment of that piece of property. Well, as an agri agricultural permitted use, they already have the right to, uh, to operate a commercial activity on it. Do they not? Under, our, under, our, under this, under 2134A, which is the controlling statute for our ordinance, it, specific, it specifically allows that um, in section um, But she's saying can you extend that to the well events there in addition to the primary commercial activity of harvesting the trees? There was, uh, wasn't there an example about uh, something with uh, <coughs> you have a hardware store you sold a couple of boards I'm not sure where that was I mean, it's, it's a matter of the board interpreting this statute in terms of whether there is a requirement of a causal link between the activity and the farming activity, or if there isn't, whether we are going to interpret this to allow any activity so long as it happens on a farm.
I, I think I think the Agriculture Commission has spoken clearly with regard to what the, the, the wedding is uh, indeed part of the agricultural use in with regard to this and, and I, I see no reason why we couldn't um, overturn the decision and remand to the agritourism definition for this particular event, this wedding event, subject to any other additions or directions to the um, to the property owner. I think it falls squarely in Roman six. What is your interpretation then of, of the clause that was referenced by Ross Bennett tonight in terms of active involvement in the activity of the farm? In terms of why that would, since you're talking, as I understand it, you say that's the only clause that has to have the causal link to the farm, and I'm not sure why it would because it already says activity of the farm. It makes the which is unnecessary, and typically in matters of statutory construction, you assume the legislature had a reason to put that in. I think what the I think what the statute is saying at this particular point, where it says or active involvement in the activity of the farm, which is ancillary to the farm operation. I think it, the statute is trying to cover a lot of different bases as well as its first part, which is enjoyment of the farm environment. So I, I think I think that there's they're, they're allow the statute's allowing for the it leaves open the door for local land use boards to define this, and I think that's what we're here to do. I I think that um, that the letter from the commissioner, uh, since it's the only thing we have from the state authority, saying that uh, that the weddings should be considered agritourism. I think the weddings are in agritourism. Uh, if I then look at 2134A, even though Roman numeral six is not under the definitions of paragraph two, Roman numeral two, it still is under the, under the whole chapter which says farm, agriculture, and farming. Therefore, I have to assume that they intended that agritourism was included in the definition of farm, agriculture, and farming. So, I think we have to consider it to be agritourism and, there, and therefore part of agriculture and therefore allowed by our zoning. But I do believe that we need to have some restrictions because of the nature of the, of the property and the safety and traffic, all the reasons we talked about. So I, I don't feel any different now that the motion that I did before that we should have a motion that, that overturns this but that uh, allows the planning board to have some, some uh, say as to how to make sure is uh, appropriate for the, for the site. And how to have them make sure it remains appropriate for the site. Other than deferring our decision to the commissioner, can you tell me why the ancillary clause would only apply to involvement in the activity of the farm? It seemed to me that would be the one definition of an activity in Roman numeral six that doesn't require an ancillary clause. So I'm having real trouble understanding why that ancillary clause doesn't apply to all activities. Well, I, I'm reading it comma or, so I'm reading it saying agriculture means either attracting visitors or working farm for the purpose of eating meat. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm looking at the placement of the comma. Okay. But does that make any sense? Uh, it does to me. Uh, it says that it can be agritourism if you're attracting visitors to a working farm. And then there'd be no requirement of causation or ancillary to the farm operation only if we're talking about active involvement in the activity. Right. Report. I'm saying that if it doesn't attract them for eating a meal or making overnight stays or ensuring the farm environment or education, then you can also get by by having it be active involvement in the activity of the farm and the farm operation. So I, I, I realize we're talking about diagramming sentences here, but I don't, I don't have else to do it. Um, so what, 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 what activity? Wait a minute. Oh, one at a time. Okay. Oh, so I was just saying, if that was the case, what what are some activities that wouldn't be included? Well, that gets back to their known limits, enjoyment of the farm environment. It's whatever anybody says causes them to enjoy the farm environment. What involvement in that to the farm wouldn't be ancillary to farm operations? This is an example of one that exactly. wouldn't be ancillary to that. Because I, I think your, the argument being raised is whether we're not rendering the last clause re redundant and meaningless. So if the two are tied together, then what activity of the farm would not be ancillary to the operation, so we know that there's something different out there. Oh, I see what you're saying. But Art said no. I can't say the word. Oh, ancillary? Okay. <laughs> it's the artist brain thing that it gets mixed up. I've got it written all over my notes, so I don't say it wrong. Yeah. If the invol active involvement in the activity of the farm wouldn't be ancillary, you're right. What activity of the farm would not be ancillary to the farm operation? Is the question. Well, I'm looking at what they're saying here, enjoyment of the farm environment. Uh, if you were to set up a drag strip on the farm, you could make a case for the people going there to watch the drag strips because of the farm environment. I think the common sense has to rule here. Uh, certainly the enjoyment of the fine environment, as stated here in, in Roman 6. Well, why do you fall under that? Uh, launching an ICBM wouldn't. Uh, operating a drag, drag strip wouldn't. Thousands and thousands of things that you could say absolutely nothing to do with enjoying the farm environment. So it is limited. But what if the farm strip, open -ended. what if your drag thing was a bunch of farm practice? I'm just saying that. You I'm wouldn't need to do that on a farm. I'm just saying that. Enough, you're there to enjoy the farm tractors. Uh, uh, people would be going to watch farm tractors to watch farm tractors, not to enjoy the farm. My, I just go back to the thing where if agritourism includes everything that you could do on a piece of farm property without any exclusions, then why couldn't every, I mean, what's the point of zoning? Why, why would you, wait, one at a time, wait. What, you know, I'm just saying, if that was the case, that if everything, because you were enjoying that piece of property when you were engaged in whatever activity you were doing, why couldn't every, I mean, what, at what point does, the zoning become like I want to go shopping and I want my mall to have a lot of trees around it. Why couldn't I put a mall up there? I mean, I'm just saying I don't my, understand my, the my, 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 my response, my response is I, I'm I'm basing my opinion on whether this is agriculture on this letter from the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture and Markets and Food. And maybe that's not appropriate, but I don't know any other authority to go to. And she's saying she's not saying that drag strips are agriculture tourism or that the mall is. She's saying that we interpret on farm weddings fall within the statutory definition. I, I just I don't know where else to go to. I mean, that, that maybe she's not appropriate. 
appropriate authority, but that's what I'm basing my opinion on. I, I understand that, and that's one piece of evidence, but if that was controlling, we wouldn't have had to have two hearings. The board is sitting as a quasi-judicial board to interpret our statute. If it was as easy as writing, getting a letter from a commissioner, we'd all be thankfully out of a job. That's fine. I'm just telling you my opinion. I, and I just, I'm only saying, making, asking my question because I don't understand the difference. And I, that's what I'm looking to. The difference between what? Why in any piece of property wouldn't be, that you could do any activity on the property for agriculture. Because I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying whatever activity it is I'm doing on the piece of property. Yeah, and kind of, in that same, in that same vein, I think probably one of the attractions for this piece of property is the wedding venue is more viewed than it is the fact that there are Christmas trees on it. You know, I've got land, trees are currently being cut out, but I raise trees on my place too. It's a very short jump from the fact that somebody's having a wedding there to, hey, this is a great environment, let's have a nice jazz concert there. And that would be people coming to the jazz concert to enjoy the same environment. I think that, you know, I think that not placing any restrictions on what can go on there would be a real mistake on our part. Because, and again, I come back to the question I asked earlier. Are we dealing with a case where the town and the life safety people can't have anything to say about what goes on there or not? And I think they should have. And that's why I think the appropriate place for that to be determined is for the applicant to go before the planning board. And, you know, if we wanted to go out on a limb and say, okay, we can only have 75 people, we can only have 10 events in a six month period. I think that if we did that, we would be doing it without a proper review by us and without proper presentation by the parties involved. And that's why I keep referring to the planning board because the planning board site review process gives everybody that's involved and interested the opportunity to come and speak to what kind of limitations there ought to be on it. So, you know, in terms of Bob's repeated reading of the letter, sure, weddings are agritourism. Okay, so what? I mean, I'm not impressed by that. So if the motion was before the board that this was a permitted use under agritourism subjected to site plan review and determination of the restrictions, that this event, the wedding event, is a permitted use and subjected to the following regulations being site plan review, is that something that's acceptable to you? Is that, I mean, is that what I'm hearing? Is that what I'm hearing from you? Okay. And I think that if we did our motion like that, as Bruce said, we would state the reason why we're doing it is because it's wedding dress, not because it's something else. And because, and we could also state that one of the justifications is the fact that the state commissioner has said that a wedding is agritourism, that we're not bringing, we're not setting precedent for rock concerts and things like that. Make a motion. Well, I'll make sort of the same motion I made before. I'll make the motion that we overturn the decision carried out by the town planner with the condition that the applicant goes to the planning board for site plan review to discuss an acceptable plan for the applicant and the abutters. In there. Wait a minute. 
Bob has made a motion, so the next procedural issue is whether or not there's a second on the motion. I'll second. Okay, discussion. I'm sorry. Um, so we need, we need to word it that we overturn the original decision, find that the property is, that agritur that the wedding event is agritourism subjected to site plan review. I, I'd assume that would be in the decision statement. Does that need to be in the motion itself? As long as we explain that in the decision, written decision. You make the motion. Well, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the motion, but if other people want to add it in, it makes it a very complicated motion, but we can do that. Or we can assume that having it in the decision. <laughs> I see what you're saying. So, it, so the, the motion to, to overturn and then in the decision that's written and published that we include the statement. Right that, now. That's fine. What's the motion on the table then? <laughs> the motion on the table is to overturn the decision. Presumably that is based on our discussion that it constitutes agritourism at this point. Yes, that's I was saying, can, can, we, can we have that in the decision, if the written decision is issued, yeah, we thought, have it in the motion. I thought that's what you were saying. Yes. But, was, was, I, I wrote it down that weddings are permitted as agritourism and uh, the applicant must go to the planning board for site. Do you want that in the motion itself? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 I would like it in the motion. That friendly that, amendment would be accepted. Yeah, yeah. And the second would be accepted. would be good. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to have a second then. Okay. Further discussion on the amended motion? Are well, you ready to vote? Can I, I just ask one question? Sure. Does that mean if that motion passes that we would, that that type of activity, that we would accept that as our term? Wedding, yes. yes. Wedding. Wedding. That's what the motion is. Weddings only? Yes. yes. I have no further discussion. I'm a little I, I, shaky on that. I guess the question is how firmly that limits the activity to just weapons. I take it the construction of that the construction of that motion limits the activities that we're approving, just wedding events. Yes. Yes. go one at a time and speak up loudly. You've got to realize she's trying to type every word that you say. That's, that's, that's all I would consider. Just 
Well, that, that yeah. is an interesting issue because you are, are you by that motion <coughs> intentionally deciding not to decide part of the appeal? Well, it means it would be uphold, upholding the decision for like events, overturning it for wedding events. Is there a distinction between a civil commitment ceremony and a wedding or a graduation event and a wedding? That, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a rock concert in a wedding. I, I would consider, excuse me, I would consider a graduation party as being something different than a wedding. Mm -hmm. I think you could do that as a private property. Uh, okay. Well, I, I, are we testifying now and arguing point? Yeah, I think fair, that would be re relatively ridiculous. But beyond that, I guess it's not worth discussing. Back to board. <laughs> issued because it was appealed and while it's appealed that issue is stayed going forward if this board were to require any further review we could similarly also stay that condition so that any weddings that were planned could continue I think that we, I, I think that the motion says that it's overturned subject to the going through a site plan review that being the case. I don't see how they hold any without site plan review. I mean, we're making, we're making, they're getting a site plan review a condition of, of withdrawing the cease and desist order. I'm going to ask for a point of order from Attorney Miller. Are you aware as to whether there are any weddings planned within the next couple of months that this would be an issue for? There are no. Okay. Then we don't need to, to agonize over that part of the motion. So are we ready to vote on this, this motion, recognizing... There's no point of order from the audience. Wait, wait. Please identify your name. Ralph Lewis. I can hear you. Whoa. Ralph Lewis. Thank you. Uh, considering this came in bits and pieces, I confess to being confused. And I request the chair read the exact motion that's before you now. I would ask our secretary to read the precise motion. Mr. Stamps moved to overturn the decision carried out by the town planner with the condition that the applicant goes to the planning board for site plan review to discuss an acceptable plan for the applicant and the abutters. He amended the motion to include that this is that weddings are presumable, um, that weddings are allowed under agritourism and will be subject to site plan review. 
It's only weddings. It's only weddings. It's only weddings. Purposes of clarification, does your definition of weddings include civil unions? Yes. Is there any further discussion with respect to the motion, or are we ready to vote? I'd just like one more thing to clarify. Um, since we're being so specific in this, we're making it uh, aimed at weddings and sensitive to weddings. So based on the commissioner's letter, I kind of said it was that. Um, should the applicant at some future time want to do something else, you would he have to initiate his whole, what would be his course of action? You mean like light defense? Yeah, light defense. <laughs> no, I think you have to come back to us again. I agree with that. But I think you would have to come back here again. He would have to come back to the zoning board with an with a variance request. Well, that's one way to to address it, or he could ask us again to. Uh, I don't know if you could you ask can. us again because you can't keep asking right. the same board, uh, uh, hoping for a different composition for right. a different answer. Correct. Um, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Okay. I just want to be careful not to make this draconian level of, of limitation. I recognize that the commissioner's letter, letter which you call it, what does it mean? It's not it does speak only to uh, to uh, merits. Uh, I don't know that was your intent, and I guess we can't know. Just concerned that that was your intent. I guess we can't. We really do. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's considered agricultural farming activities. I think that when, when planning to do something, we'll just take the example that somebody was talking about. If instead of a wedding, we're going to start having graduation parties and rock concerts, then I think it's appropriate to go back to the planning board and get an approval for that different use in the tax that is taking place on the And I think that, that's already a part of the regulations, really, talking about the change of use or the different use or the additional use of the property. Hmm. And so that they wouldn't necessarily have to come back to us as long as they get final board approval for the change of use. Contract for drag races. <laughs> we ready to vote? Yeah. Okay. Thus? I started with Bruce last okay. time. Well, that's <laughs> Uh, I agree. Yes. Yes. I disagree. I agree. Motion carries. Are there any further motions that need to be made? Town Council is shaking his head. That's a good sign. <laughs> um, we will come out of board deliberations at this point. We. We'll be issuing a written decision shortly, uh, probably within two weeks because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Oh, did you want to give you a few minutes? So, yeah. Really not up to it. Okay. <laughs>